Last time, we looked at a third volume-based indicator called the Money Flow Index. And one of the advantages that this has is because its calculation produces a range-bound output between 0 and 100, it means that the implementation of it into an algo might be slightly easier than the other two volume-based indicators that we studied. But that's only of any benefit, of course, if the indicator itself provides valuable intelligence about the markets. And so in this episode, I'll be looking at two ways that the Money Flow Index can be put to use to interpret what's happening in the market, and more importantly, what might happen next. Stay tuned. As with the majority of indicators, there are many ways of interpreting them. And usually, the method you choose will be determined by what you're attempting to achieve and the type of system that you're developing. And earlier on in this YouTube playlist, I spent a lot of time explaining different techniques that can be utilized for a variety of indicators. And so if you haven't watched those videos already, you might want to take a look at them at some point. I've put a link top right now that takes you to a good starting point for those videos if you're interested. But today, I'm going to put that into practice for the Money Flow Index and look at the two techniques that are most widely associated with this indicator. So let's take a look. So last time, if you remember, we looked at the basics around the Money Flow Index and also the calculation that sits behind it. So we're now going to look at typical uses and techniques for this indicator, which of course, as we discussed, is range bound between 0 and 100. So the first example is around overbought and oversold characteristics. Now, because of the way that the Money Flow Index is calculated, many people have drawn similarities with the RSI indicator. But the big difference here is that RSI uses price alone, whereas the Money Flow Index incorporates the volume data into the calculation. And because of this, many, including myself, would consider that these volume-based indicators give us a truer picture of what's actually happening in the price action than the price action does itself. And the reason for that is because very often price moves can appear to be strong, but they're actually based on very weak volume. And so although they appear to be strong, the trend that's produced might actually be very weak. And so if RSI is an indicator that you currently use, this might be something that you want to test out to see if this improves your results. But in terms of the overbought and oversold characteristics, let's take a look at a few examples here. So I've got the levels set on the MFI here to 20 and 80. And when the indicator passes below that 20 level, this is an indication that the asset has become oversold. And when that's the case, that very often represents a turning point in the price. And as you can see by looking upwards to the price action, this is what happens in this case. Let's take a look at another example. Now here, the indicator is correct in predicting the turning point in price. However, in this case, the price reversal doesn't go on for as long as the first example I showed. But of course, that's not what this type of indicator is designed to do. It's designed to tell you the turning points not necessarily how long that price will continue for. Here's an example on the overbought side. So the indicator here passed above the level of 80. And again, you can see that that coincides with a high in the price action. But there's a warning, as there is for any indicator. And that is just because you get a signal that the asset is overbought, for example, doesn't necessarily make that a good trading opportunity. So as you can see in this case here, yes, this high level of the indicator does correctly produce a turning point, but it's only a minor one. 
and the price continues in the original direction upwards after 10 or so bars. And so because of this, with any indicator, you of course need to incorporate good risk management and you need to know what your system's going to do to prevent major losses when the signal doesn't go in your favor. And as I said before, I really would encourage you if you're already a user of the RSI to try out this indicator as a direct replacement for that. Look at charts, do a visual comparison, backtest to see how that compares. And because of that incorporation of the volume data, you may well find that you get better results than by using RSI. So now let's look at the second example, which is divergences. So here, if you remember, we're looking for differences between the price action and the indicator. So let's first of all concentrate on this area here. So as you can see, we're in a clear uptrend, but compare this to what the MFI is telling us. And if we connect the peaks here, we can see that the indicator is actually falling. And this discrepancy between the two is what's typically called a divergence. So let's think about what this is actually telling us. If you were to look at the price action alone without any indicators, you may well think that this is an extremely healthy, strong trend. And if that were the case, then this might be a good trend to get into in the belief that it will continue for some time. But the fact that the upwards volume is decreasing as the trend progresses tells us that actually the trend is weakening. And when that happens, the probabilities switch over. It then becomes more probable that the price will fall, as you can see here. And so this divergence between the price and indicator gave us the clue that that might happen. Let's take a look at another example. So here again, we find ourselves in a position where we're in an established uptrend, if a little erratic. And again, if we connect the two peaks here together, we see that that's increasing. And again, in the same way as before, if we compare that to the indicator, we see that here it's actually decreased. And so again, we have a divergence. And when we have a divergence, that gives us a clue to the probabilities of what will happen next. And in this particular case, rather than heading straight down, we see some sideways movement first of all, and then the price falls. Now, just one further note in terms of how you interpret this kind of data. If the price action is moving upwards, typically you will draw these trend lines on the peaks of both the price and the indicator. However, when prices are moving downwards, you should then draw the trend lines on the troughs of the price action and also the troughs of the indicator. So for example, if we look at this price action here as the price is coming down, we'd want to be connecting these troughs here that you would see forming a downtrend line. And then on the indicator below, you'd want to connect the troughs here. So again, you can actually see we have a divergence here, which is predicting that we'll have a reversal in the price going upwards. So we've now spent quite a lot of time looking at various different options for analyzing volume data, including the raw volume and also the three indicators. Now, in the next episode, I'm going to hold a volume indicator shootout. And in this, I'll be comparing side by side on balance volume, accumulation distribution, and the money flow index that we've seen today. So be sure to tune into that episode. Remember to give me a like if you got value from today. And now until next time, trade wise, trade safe.